Airbnb, that's the online service that lets people rent their homes to strangers, has raised $450 million in a fundraising valuing the site at $10 billion. It's a website, people. This makes the company one of the world's most valuable startups. So what does this mean for the tech sector as a whole and other tech startups? Joining me now, our financial panel, Alan Haft, author of You Can Never Be Too Rich, amen to that, Sean Hyman, trader and editor of Money News Ultimate Wealth Report, and Kyle Harrington, founder of Harrington mm -hmm. Capital Management. Kyle, I'll start with you. Really? That kind of valuation on Airbnb five years ago? Where was this company? I, I, is this a real company? Well, I, you know, I actually, Jerry, think it is a very real company. It's interesting how, I don't know about valuation, right, Jerry, but, you know, this is definitely a testament to the valuation by such an injection of capital to the tune of $450 million. But this company uh, in San Francisco has made significant inroads for people who want to uh, list their property for vacation rentals sure. and it's taken a lot of share away from hotels. Sure, sure, it does that, it does a great job, but Alan, really it gets this kind of valuation? I mean, from investors, I'm shocked. Why so high and what does it tell you about the rest of tech stock land? I mean, look, it's really opening up the hotel space to Main Street America. Everybody's bedroom and everybody's closet and everybody's couch is all of a sudden going to become a contender. <laughs> In the um, in the hotel market, so I, I don't I don't actually disagree so much with the valuation if you believe in the long term prospects of the company and the the enormous audience that they can they, Sean, that they can tap into. Sean, they're they're valued higher than major hotel chains. Their website, they all they do is match buyers and sell it. That's it. That's all they got going for them. I'm sorry, I seem to be, you know, underplaying their value in the marketplace. But I think every once in a while you have to ask questions like this. <clears throat> It is, and w when the hype is high, the valuation can be high. And so anytime you got a new, flashy, shiny thing, it's not that it may not be become a very legitimate business, it may, but, but you know, do you overpay for anything, even if it is a legitimate business? And that's the question really to ask right now. I mean, do you take a $200,000 house and pay a million dollars for it, even though it's a great house and a viable house in a great neighborhood? And that's kind of the way, you know, the situation this is, is you know, really right now. It's, it's really probably overpaying for something that may be a viable a uh, stream of income that will perpetuate into the future. Well, I, I, I'm sort of shocked by this, but apparently you guys uh, think this makes all the sense in the world. And, of course, if you look at what's happened to the NASDAQ, with the exception of the last few weeks, I mean, you know, tech stocks have been on fire until they had their kind of severe correction. Let's talk a little bit about how some of these huge mutual fund companies, BlackRock, Fidelity, T. Rowe, Price, are all jumping on board, all going to Silicon Valley and investing directly in some of these tech stocks. Alan, is that a good idea? Um, you know, the, 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 the mutual funds are only allowed to invest up to 15% of their assets into, um, into these startup companies. And I know a lot of retail customers that, that really do want to get involved in the startup. So if you have the risk in your belly and you're going after growth and you have about five years or longer before you, uh, before you need your money, as long as you understand that you got some risk there, it doesn't bother me so much. I think it's actually a good upside potential, a huge upside potential. And as long as the mutual funds are spreading their bets across that 15% maximum, I don't think it's such a bad bet. Well, Sean, I mean, this is what the professional investors do, right? I mean, you look at how Harvard deploys its endowment. I mean, that's, they're investing in this very kind of thing directly. Maybe this is the wave of the future for individual investors. <laughs> Well, and, and it's good for Harvard and, and different ones because they have the excess capital to, you know, to play with. So, I mean, if you're a player that's got $100 million, $200 million, uh, plus to, to invest in, you can spread that around. And if two out of ten uh, investments make it, those two can fly so high that they can make up for the other eight that failed. But your average investor really has a hard time doing this. And they have the hard time you know, handling the volatility of the S&P 500, much less the volatility that could be with these investments. So my concern is that they really don't understand the risks associated with these investments and huh. probably would do, you know, do poorly within them. Well, good point. I, I think uh, you make a very good point there. Uh, we were talking earlier in the show, Kyle, and I want to hear what you have mm -hmm. to say about this. 73% of Americans have not gotten back into the stock market since the, the disaster that was five years ago. What do you say to them tonight? I say this. I say the stock market in the United States is and still will, you know, will be the only game in town for outsized returns. And I think that you need to be invested in the market uh, with fixed income rates and bank rates being so low, Jerry. Uh, you just right. need to be cautious and smart about entry points. 
and diversification of your overall portfolio so you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Alan. Yeah, look, uh, the, not being in the market and trying to grow your money is a recipe for, for a certain failure because you can't grow your money anywhere else, especially over a long period of time. So for somebody that wants to have a, ch a chance of success of growing their money, you have to be invested in the market. Now, that being said, for the risk-adverse people out there, you should learn a little bit about other investments. There's structured CDs that protect you on the downside. If you hold your money till maturity, you still get the, some of the upside of the markets. You can do things in your portfolio, such as stop losses. You can do some options. You can do some options, and some of these things scare people. But with a little bit of uh, education, Jerry, a, a, a risk-adverse investor can really bet wisely in the market just with a little bit of education. And Sean. Yeah, if I mean, you've got to outpace inflation. Inflation is right. going to increase three to five percent a year, and so if oh, you don't Lord, get involved with stocks, you're going to lose money by default. So you have to be involved with stocks. Now, I would say if you haven't gotten in up till this point, you might wait for some pretty good size corrections yeah. to to happen before getting in. I would advise that. But other than that, you still do need to be in the stock market over time and get used to that being a part of your life. Stocks for the long haul, even with volatility. Alan, Sean, and Kyle, thanks for being on the show tonight. Great to see you guys. Thanks for having us.